Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the LawCast. This time, we're going back to cover the show that broke pro wrestling and gave us the modern era. It's Fastlane 2015. Kush, have we ever really escaped from this three-week period in February 2015? It's so fascinating to think that of all the things that have ever happened in pro wrestling, a random February pay-per-view in 2015 in the midst of a drought both creatively and business-wise is so goddamn important that it literally, eight years later, is point for point dictating what happens this year. Yeah. I it, I don't know if we'd have an AEW if not for a few creative decisions they made at this time. That's so interesting. And, like, I really want to talk about some of that as we get into this show because I think you're right. Like, if they don't fuck up Gold Dust versus Stardust to this extent, is there that inspiration for Cody to do it in his own promotion? And that match is the one that really sells people on the concept. Yeah. With that one, I, I also wonder how much Dusty dying that had a huge impact yeah. on him. But. You know, I, that, like, the use of Dean Ambrose, John Moxley, obviously the Daniel Bryan, Roman Reigns thing. This this is a breaking point for a sub. There's a section of the fan base that just gave up on WWE after this. And here's the fascinating thing, is that we know, because they pivoted last year, they're finally aware of that section of the audience. And they're working that section of the audience because they understand that there's money in that. However... That's not the section of the audience that they're trying to please. So we have this weird dichotomy where, like, half of the card is full of the guys that they know the hardcore fans like, but they all lose. They always lose. So, yeah. Well, all that. But first, we've got some very interesting current wrestling news to talk about. Um, leading off, um, new development in the Vince McMahon lawsuit. Um as reported by, uh, this was John Pollock, um, John Pollock, Brandon Thurston, I think Tim Marchman is the guy who uh, previously worked advice until they fired everybody advice, unfortunately. That guy seems like a great reporter. Somebody should hire that guy. Uh, they've re- reported that Nick Khan is, in fact, WWE executive number one in the lawsuit against WWE. We had been speculating that this was either Nick Khan or Triple H, and it turns out it's Nick Khan. Yeah, the other executive turned out to be, like, a, a director of something. I don't really remember. I didn't recognize his name. He's but. not there. Yeah, he's not there anymore. And, like, so the significant thing about this is it does not mean that Nick Khan is guilty of having participated in any of this. All it means is that he did absolutely justifiably know that it was happening. So like, that's, what, that's what's in the lawsuit is that the woman recalls like running to him, like Vince telling her, oh, like, make sure you get to know Nick. He's important. And I think he was he the one I can't remember if it was number one or number two. And I think it was him who Vince told her, like, if anything ever happens to me, like, go to Nick and he'll take care of you. He knows who you are. But she introduced herself to Nick Khan in the hallway and he was like, oh, I know exactly who you are, which she obviously thought was weird that I don't remember what his title was at the time, but that a guy that important would know who she was. Yeah, I think he was like chief financial officer at the time. Yeah. But yeah, that- just imagine being Nick Khan and he had just started like he started at the company right around that time. He was new there. And having Vince tell you, like, oh yeah, I hired my girlfriend to work in the office. Like literally like he must have been in the office getting his orientation while, like, Vince was getting a blowjob from this woman. Like, like, oh, yeah, and this is the woman I keep around so I can rape her repeatedly. Like, what kind of orientation even is that? And, like, look, I'm not going to make any kind of judgments about Nick Khan based on this. Like, obviously, you would like to think that somebody would not just aid and abet this kind of behavior. But whatever. I'm not there. He's just he's doing a job, whatever. Uh, but at the very least – you can say pretty concretely that he knew that this was going on and he might be asked to testify. Yeah, I, the thing I'm curious about is what kind of internal investigation is WWE conducting into this? Because it feels like feels like there should be one, but I don't think that Brock Lesnar has been added back to the roster webpage, so 
either he's been cleared or more likely they just don't really care and they think enough time has passed that this will blow over if they bring him back. And they're probably right. I think that the company has fully come to the terms with the idea that they will do anything that they need to do to make sure that all the blame stays on Vince permanently. Yeah, and they will give probably they a will, smart strategy. Yeah, they will give up any information they need to give up to see that Vince is put in jail or whatever, just so, because that clears them as long as all the blame's on him. Yeah, I mean, it's the right way to go to just blame. And, you know, Netflix, that was, uh, that was 100% Netflix's line when they were asked about their partnership with WWE. They, I said the Netflix person essentially said the problem was Vince McMahon and Vince isn't there anymore. Yeah. So while we know probably with great degree of certainty that both Triple H and Nick Khan and Stephanie were all aware of these activities, and if they did not directly contribute to them, they certainly stopped them. Look, like the world's going to move on. Corporate business operates this way. The the public vision of this is that now that Vince is gone, everything's fine. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm sure we'll have more developments in this story, as we've been saying every time we cover it. It's not going anywhere. I hope anywhere. so. Because, like, I keep waiting for, like, the day that, like, Triple H's name comes up. Because he's really the one that, like... The only person who it will really matter if they get rid of at this point is him. (laughs) It was kind of buried in the article, but Stephanie McMahon was confirmed to be one of the unnamed executives, although she appears very briefly in the lawsuit. It's something like Janelle Grant recalls being at a meeting and Stephanie, like, having her sit next to her. Yeah. Not not a ton there. It's kind of weird that she was even, like, mentioned, but it might just be because of who she is. Probably. All right. Story number two, happier times. Okada debuts in AEW, and he's a heel and joined up with the Young Bucks. That is not what I expected, and I absolutely love it. I could not be more over the moon about this way of debuting Okada. You get the Bucks to act as his mouthpieces. You get to, like, let him do, like... If you guys don't know, the actual real-life Okada is like a silly, goofy motherfucker who loves to play jokes, and he has a big, goofy grin, and he's a comedy dude. He's just also a killer and the greatest of all time in the ring. So the opportunity to see both sides of that, so fucking good. Yeah, I just, this is so much better than him being the bland baby face that he would have been. Yeah, here's the thing. Okada's too perfect to be a baby face. Way too perfect. He's giant, he's handsome, he's the best ever ever in the ring. Like, he's got everything. Like, that man cannot be a babyface. He's always been a much better heel. So this is perfect. Now he's like the Young Bucks, the Trump card. Like, an unbeatable, like, dominant fucker. The amount of heat that is for the Young Bucks that they now have, the greatest wrestler of all time backing them up. And I just love that it works with the real-life thing of it. Because, like, the reason he did come to this promotion is no small part because of the Bucks. Like, the people, everything Okada's done in his career is more or less because the Young Bucks were nice to him one time in TNA when he hated life and wanted to kill himself. (laughs) You know, you never know who's got who being nice to is going to pay off for, pay off later in life. I can't remember who said it, but somebody was just like, imagine that you make friends with the weird kid sophomore year of high school, and then he goes number one in the NBA draft, and he remembers all your inside jokes. That's Okada, baby. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Who, who are you most excited to see him work with? I mean, it's cheating to say Kenny, right? Yeah. Like it's, that, it's we cheating. Got, we've got to get that match one more time. Maybe that's. Forbidden Door, maybe it's Wembley. I don't know when Kenny's going to be ready. We might have to wait a while, but if Kenny can only do, even if he could only do one more match, I think that would be the match. Now, the funny thing is, uh, the, the answer could almost be anybody, because this is a roster full of incredible wrestlers, of which Okada's wrestled maybe five of them in his entire career. Like, yeah. after watching Okada wrestle, like, the same ten guys for the last ten years, suddenly... We can watch it. He's wrestling Pac this week. Pac! <laughs> no, that's a double throwaway match, but I didn't know I needed to see that until now. Right? Yeah. Like, they're going to put him in the ring with, like, Penta, and I'm going to be like, whoa! Yeah. Let's think of this AEW roster. 
basically everybody on this roster can wrestle. Yes. <laughs> Very few guys who can't put on a good to great match, and now you get to put them up against Okada. Even, like, the big hosses in this promotion, like Powerhouse Hobbs and Big Bill, those sound like great fucking matches to me. Brody King. Yeah. Dude! Oh, man. But honestly, the answer to your question is I'm dying to see him get in the ring with Moxley because it's never happened. Oh, that would be fascinating. I want to see Deathmatch Okada. <sighs> and finally, another AEW story. AEW Big Business is, um, well, by the time this drops, it'll be tonight. Um, we're going to see the debut of Mercedes. How big can she be? What what do we think they're going to do with her? Is she going to be a needle mover? Now, here's the thing. It's like, it's always been clear that it, she has moved the needle in places she's been. She drew the highest, like, live gates that New Japan has had in America. She always moved ratings and pay-per-view buys when she was in WWE. It's clear that she does move the needle. Is she capable of basically resurrecting this women's division by herself? Mm. I don't know. I think it'll really depend on if she finds a foil that really works. Because, again, like, the most she drew was with Charlotte, and I don't think that works with just one person. Yeah, and that's the, that's the frustrating thing is, as she comes into this women's division, I don't feel like anybody is particularly over to be her opponent. J- Jade Cargill was who I wanted to see, and Jade's yeah. in WWE now. I would be very interested in Athena, because I think they can yep. get there. But she's not there now, and, like, she's done all of her best work in Ring of Honor where nobody saw it. So, I don't know. Um, There's certainly people who are options. They've got a ton of talent. It's just a matter of, can she do it on her own? I don't know. And it kind of seems like she's making, like, a three-year and if it doesn't pay off, she can always go back to WWE, you know? Yeah. If they just make her an afterthought. She said in an interview this week that she sees herself going back to WWE someday. Probably. Yeah. That's fine. Hopefully she can hopefully she can elevate AEW in the meantime. They could use a spark. Yeah. I mean if like it you've signed that contract when you're like thirty eight just to ride out your career Nakamura style, I think that's a great use of your time. Yeah, how old is she even? Thirty two. Yeah. That's, That's crazy wild. young. There's no reason. Listen, WWE's great success with their current boom period that they're in. I don't know how many people really like process this, but it's because of how much they invested in their women. Like that, their broadcasts are now roughly half and half women and men. Yep. And that was previously unthinkable. But I honestly think that that's a gigantic part of what has like made this boom period possible. Can AEW commit to something like that? I don't know. I, when you look at the scope of this promotion, the women's division is really the thing they've done the worst. Yeah. It's just, it's clicked intermittently. They've had a few good moments. Like that Thunder Rosa Britt Baker match was unbelievable, but it's always been fleeting. They've never, I don't know, lack of focus. Politics, it's hard to put my finger on exactly what the issue's been. I think there's an idea that there can only really be one women's program at a time, and that's really prevented more of the women for getting over and being ready for the next program. You know what I mean? It's like, they always have one thing going on, but they never have a second thing going on. <laughs> so, I don't know. If it were me, i just give them collision and make it the women's show. You now have a star who is capable of carrying a show on her own. It's kind of shocking to me that with the demand for more programming that WWE hasn't done an all-women show yet. It's pretty, honestly, like, it, I would not find it odd at all if they just did, like, Raw is all women. Because they have so much talent. And, like, look at all the talent in NXT. They got, like, 20 women yeah. ready to come up now. I think the, the women's NXT roster is a lot stronger than the men. Way stronger. It's not even close. So, like, look, guys, like, at some point. All right. So uh, let's turn the time machine back to February 2015. Where do we even start with this? Yeah. Let's start. Okay. 
here's what was supposed to happen. Yes. Daniel Bryan won the world title at the previous WrestleMania. He was supposed to get mauled like a zebra in the Serengeti by Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. Yeah, you remember that John Cena match where he took 100,000 suplexes and Brock won? That was supposed to be Brian. They just yeah. put Cena in the same match. Yeah, but Brian had his neck problem, so he had to forfeit the title. And instead, Lesnar killed Cena, which made him a huge baby face. Whereas killing Brian would have made him a huge heel. And like, if he, if he had done that to Daniel Bryan, I legitimately think the crowd might have rioted. Uh, if the person with a horrific neck yeah. problems went into that match and got dropped on his neck 28 times in a row, yeah, I think so. So the idea was Brock Lesnar is going to be the biggest, nastiest heel on the planet. And then he'll lose the title at WrestleMania to Roman Reigns, the new golden boy. And everybody will be so happy Roman beat Brock that he'll be a huge babyface star. The problem is, is that that John Cena match, as you said, turns Brock face. And either Brock's not happy about having to do the job to Roman anyway, or he just starts to enjoy being a babyface for once. Because he really starts playing into that and seriously undermining what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, the other couple things that go wrong here, Roman, they do some, I mean, there's some bad creative with him, the suffering suck attack. Suffering suck attack. Trying to make him a jokey, like, you know, John Cena, rock type baby face, which he's, oh, would, he has never been suited to play that kind of role, but especially back then, he could not, no one, I think, could have pulled off that kind of dialogue, but especially he was not suited to it. And he got injured right as he was starting his solo run, so we kind of skipped the whole rise portion. Yeah, by the time that he came back, they had just already, like, moved him up without us getting to, like, enjoy the rise and root for him. So it really felt, in a time where we were extra sensitive to the office pushing people above who we want, no one has ever been more transparently pushed ahead of the people we wanted. <laughs> Yeah, the other problem, well, there's a series of problems here. Another problem, Thanksgiving 2014, the CM Punk Colt Cabana podcast drops, has all kinds of ripple effects, but one of them is on there. He keeps, re he relays that story about how, like, when they were going to have him wrestle the Shield, they kept telling him, like, oh, you got to make Roman look strong. You got to make Roman look strong. And that's the beginning of the fan back. I mean, there was already some people being grumbly about Roman, but that added to it. And, like, all throughout this, I just want to make this clear. We now live on the other side of this. We live in the wonderful scenic bays of Roman Reigns is amazing. They finally found the role he was meant to play. Thank We all appreciate him. Thank God. Thank God we're here. At the time... No one has ever been more snake bitten during a push ever in the history of wrestling. Like maybe they should have cooled him off at certain points just to save him, but they just keep marching him out there in front of everybody to die. And then the other thing that goes wrong, Daniel Bryan comes back from his neck injury. Um, they bring it, and they bring him back before the Royal Rumble, which is such a self-inflicted wound. If he was going to be in the Royal Rumble, he needed to win it. Apparently, they haven't learned anything from last year. I, I think it's very, very clear from how they handle Bryan coming back that they never saw him as a long-term main eventer at all. And they were like, oh, this will be a nice story, and then we can put him back at Intercontinental level where he actually belongs. They in no way expected that when he came back, we would immediately have in our minds, oh, okay, so the top guy is back, sick. Like, they, it never occurred to them we would feel that way. I mean, do you sympathize with, you know, Vince and creative at all here? Like, they had Daniel Bryan win the title in the main event of WrestleMania the previous year. Does WrestleMania every year have to be about Daniel Bryan? Is that the standard? Well, here's the thing, is that I, I am somewhat sympathetic, but I also feel like they made their own bed with this one. Because, again, there are certain things that you could have easily done to avoid this scenario. And the easiest one is bring Bryan back the day after the Rumble. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody would have been like, oh, they fucked us by not having him come back 
before the Rumble. Everybody would just been, have been so happy he was back. And there were no rumblings that he was going to come no, back. It was I, thought he, we all thought he was, I think we all thought he was having to retire. Yeah, when he came out on that Raw, I think we were all like, oh, he's going to get to be GM or something like that. And then he just announced he was back. He was and like, like oh. the And the response to that was so unbelievably strong. Uh, of course you would think he's going to win the Rumble and go to Mania. Why wouldn't you think that? Yeah, and him against Brock Lesnar would have been an awesome WrestleMania main event. And it would have been much, it would have been much better for the company's long term if inst- if Brian had been in the main event and Reigns had been winning the Intercontinental Title at this WrestleMania. That is absolutely correct, but and that's, here what, we are. And that's what they would do today because Triple H is a much more patient Booker than Vince was. That's the funny thing is that now people are like constantly complaining about how patient Triple H is, despite the fact that it has paid endless dividends. Like the fact it's so clear that people are not only willing to wait, but they want to wait. Yeah. People don't know what they, people don't know what they want. They have to be told what they want. They want to see something on the horizon and then actually get there. That's the, that's the joy. But yeah, so at the Royal Rumble, Daniel Bryan got thrown out, you know, 20 minutes into the match like he was a sack of shit, like knocked off the the apron and fell on his ass like a jabroni. That's the thing, too. Like, maybe you could have him at the Rumble, but put him in a match. Make it clear he's not going to be in the Rumble match. You know, they did that the previous year, and it was a disaster. Yeah, that's true. You got it. Again, you just can't have him be there at all. Like, but he shouldn't have. Yeah, he shouldn't have been in the match. He shouldn't have come back. The other thing at the Rumble, you could have had him wrestle Brock Lesnar for the title at the Rumble. Yeah, you could have done that. And like, I don't know if maybe fans are still gonna, you know, complain about it if he didn't win the Rumble. But I, I don't know. On some level, fans just needed to have it acknowledged that Daniel Bryan was awesome. Like, I just want to like pitch you like a like a fantasy booking here. What if we got, like, a couple week-long thing where, like, The Miz is trashing Daniel Bryan or something like that? I don't even know why, but, like, it could just be. Yeah, and just can you the imagine Miz. the segment where, like, he's been bashing and bashing him, and then Bryan comes out and he's like, guess what? I'm cleared, motherfuckers. Yeah. You couldn't have that work. If Miz over and over is just like, Daniel Bryan is too much of a coward to show up and wrestle me. He'll never do it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, like bring him back to, like, Oh, it's Daniel Bryan Appreciation Night, and then Miz just buries him and buries him and buries him. That would have been a white-hot WrestleMania match. Yeah. So, after Bryan got thrown out, they proceeded to boo. The fans booed the rest of the match. They booed everybody, especially Roman Reigns. And they there booed are, The Rock when he came out to help Reigns. Famously, and this is important, too, because, like, this isn't – only about Daniel Bryan. This is about like that kind of guy too. And the only other guy on the whole roster that fans are rallying behind at all, mostly due to his performance at Survivor Series, is this is a moment for Dolph Ziggler. Yeah. Where like the fans are like, if I can't have Daniel, then give us Dolph. They're giving you two options. And like when Dolph comes out in the Rumble, he gets the only actual cheer for the rest of the Rumble, and then he also is thrown out like a bag of shit. Yeah, that was the other thing I thought is I when I thought maybe they were gonna surprise when Brian got thrown out. I thought maybe they were gonna surprise us and have Ziggler win. I'm like, they can't be so dumb as to like throw Roman to the wolves like this. But it turned out they were exactly that dumb. I literally put a money bet down that year that Ziggler was going. Because that's just how, like, ridiculous we had all gotten at the time, is that, like, we had all, as a internet community, convinced ourselves that, like, they can't possibly be so dumb as to think that that push is really going to work. They're going to counter-program like they did last year, and maybe it's Ziggler's turn. Nope. (laughs) So, Rock fucked off after this, did not want to be associated with his cousin. Um, Yeah, let's do a quick word picture. That, That moment... Or, like, who was beating up Roman? Was it, like, the Wyatt family or something? Big Show and... Uh, oh, the Authority? Yeah, Big Show and Kane, I think. So, the Rock's music hits, and he runs down, and he gets some, like, tepid cheers. Yeah. Like some, and then he gets down there, and they beat up the Authority <sighs> together, and then he raises Roman's hand. 
And the loudest booze I've ever heard in my life cascade down from everywhere. <laughs> and The Rock is holding up at Roman's hand, but then he gets this look in his eye, and he kind of looks out of the corner of his eye at the crowd. And I've never seen someone's body language more clearly say, oh, I fucked up. Oh, no. <laughs> he sees the look to me. It's puzzlement. He's like, wait, what? Like, people are mad? What the hell's going on here? Like, because obviously he he's not keeping up. He hasn't been watching the shows. He doesn't know. Like, and even if he had been, like, he wouldn't have seen this backlash coming. Yeah. God knows the the company didn't see it coming. They're like, oh, man, we're just going to sprinkle some rock dust on your yeah. cousin, and then maybe you guys can work together down the road. And Rock's like, okay, cool. Literally like a cliched, the record scratch, you're probably wondering how I got here moment. That moment, that literal expression on the Rock's face leads us directly here to today. Yeah. Because the Rock does not appear in a WWE ring again until this year. Where he does what he does, comes back to face Roman, receives the exact same response, and says, no, 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 no. Yeah. no I'm they just going to turn heel. They learned, they learned their lesson. Yeah. At least The Rock did, because this really all seems so Rock motivated. I think Triple H gets it, too. And you can – I my guess is when Rock was like, oh, yeah, we'll do me and Roman this year – I get the sense Triple H was like, I don't know, big man. They really want Cody, I think. And they, he was probably like, oh, don't worry about it. And then Triple H was probably kind of smug when it turned out that he was right. Yeah. Triple H was at least smart enough to put in an escape hatch in case it yeah. went wrong. Because uh, Triple H has his finger on the pulse of the fan base much more than Vince did at this point. Oh, God, yeah. That's this not even really close. But it's just so fascinating to think that, like, this show – is such a direct, like, mirrored reflection of what we are in now. Except this time, I really think they're kind of sticking the landing on this, where they're kind of having their cake and eating it, too, in a way they definitely weren't smart enough to do back then. Yeah, I think this is. I think what they're doing this year is great. And they'll get, they'll get to Rock Roman eventually. That's probably next year. Yeah, that's the fascinating thing, is we're getting the Rock. We're getting the Rock in with the bloodline, and we're getting Cody finishing the story without blowing off Rock Roman yet. Like, that's, 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 that's very good smart. Shit. Yeah. So, one of the more interesting twists to this story, a massive snowstorm hit the northeastern United States the next day, so they had to cancel Raw. Uh, do you remember this Raw they did from WWE headquarters? Oh, I vaguely do, yeah. Yeah, so they showed the entire Royal Rumble match, and they showed – the triple threat match with Roman, with Brock and Cena and Rollins from the previous night. And then they just mixed in some really good inter, some really good sit down interviews with Rollins, with, um, Lesnar, and then they did a fit with Brian, and then they did a Lesnar and Reigns face off. And the thing I found so interesting rewatching this was Paul Heyman goes on and on about his relationship with Afa and Sika, how they broke him into the business, how he took Yokozuna's first publicity photos, how he managed Rikishi, and he's just talking about how much, like, love and affection he has for Roman's family. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, this son of a bitch is writing the Bloodline storyline right here. He's creating the escape hatch for Vince, that he's laying the groundwork that he should turn heel and become Roman's manager at WrestleMania. And Vince doesn't guess, take that off ramp, of course. I would be willing to bet that Paul just thought that's where the story was going, so he was trying to get out in front of it. And he was probably, like, surprised when it's like, oh, wait, that's not what we're doing? It's so obviously what we should be doing. <laughs> But yeah, the fact that here, nine years ago, he was laying out the future. Yeah, because Paul Heyman is a much smarter booker than Vince McMahon. And this is what they should have done. They should have just had Roman turn heel at WrestleMania and have Heyman be his manager and give him the Usos as his bodyguards and just do the bloodline back then. There's really no reason not to. And, like, I'm not sure that it works exactly the same. Not as well. Roman, Roman, Roman not wasn't the performer. performer. But, like, it still would have been good. Yeah. It would have been way better than what we got instead, which was 
five years of malaise of them. Tr- the entire next five years are them trying to construct scenarios to get Roman Reigns cheered and never being able to do it until he gets cancer. And even then, I don't know, the crowd is like kind of lukewarm. They're like, well, we're not going to boo him, but we still don't really like him that much. I'll do you one better. This pay-per-view and this run-up to it goes so badly that they spend the next five years trying to re-engineer this exact same match and moment to get yes. it right this time. They <laughs> keep doing Brock and Roman, and it keeps bombing over and over. Until they finally get it right, because it turned out the combination all along was heel Roman baby face Brock. <laughs> Yeah, did not think Brock Lesnar was going to turn out to be as good a baby face as it turned out he was. But there you go. The best match these two ever had was heel Roman baby face Brock. So the speculation was, are they like, you know, they pivoted the year before. Will they pivot again? You know, are they going to add Brian to it and make it a triple threat? Are they going to pull Roman out and replace him with Brian? Are they maybe going to do two matches and have Brian get a shot at you know, the winner, or have Brian face Lesnar first. I th- I'm sure they at least discussed it. You know, Meltzer reported that there was at least a discussion about changing the main event, but Vince was stubborn this time. He did not want to make that change. It's also funny because, like, as much as we said, like, oh, they got to pivot from Batista to Brian, like, Batista was not nearly as reviled as Roman Reigns is here. Like, they... If they had had a better heel for Batista to go up against, I honestly think they would have just stuck that one out. I think Orton was the problem with that whole package. Meanwhile, here, it's so obvious you cannot, cannot do this match, even if Brian's not nearly as hot as as he was the year before. But even then, they're just like, no, we're doing it. Shut up. Shut up. It's tough. to. I don't think you could pull Roman out because I just feel like that destroys him. The triple threat... I wouldn't have loved that either. I don't know. But it's, also, it's tough. It's like, again, are we, do we have to do Daniel Bryan in the main event of WrestleMania every year? Do we have to? It's the equivalent of the Cody Crybabies this year. I also want to be clear about this, and I know people aren't going to like to hear this, but Bryan isn't even remotely as hot here as he was. And no, so like, he had his moment. Yeah, it's not as slammed. The story. Yeah, it's not a slam dunk, uh, just put Brian in there, that's the right decision, as it was the year before. It's not. They don't have that guy who definitely should be there instead of Reigns. It should be Reigns. It just should be Reigns better than this. Yeah, it's too It's too soon for Reigns. I, he was in the Shield until July, and then... He was on his own for literally a month or two before he got hurt. It was too soon to put him in the main event of WrestleMania and try to have him win the title. Who would you have put in the main event of this WrestleMania? Daniel Bryan! Yeah? What's Daniel Bryan? Like, I would have been building towards Ziggler, but then once Bryan got cleared, I would have done Bryan. Or The Undertaker! Undertaker Lesnar, round two. Taker's back for his revenge. If he can't beat Lesnar this time, he'll retire. Honestly, that's probably the match that this should be. Undertaker making his entrance as the sun sets in San Francisco. Like how beautiful that would have been. The old gunslingers back for one last ride. Do you understand how mad people would have been if Seth Rollins had cashed in during (laughs) that match? You couldn't have done that. That would have been 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 bad. But, yeah, The, The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar would have been a really strong main event for this one. But I think maybe they were thinking of saving that for Dallas the next year, but they didn't get there. Yeah. This is just that thing. Like, if you do that, maybe you can do, like, the Shield triple threat in the undercard or... Sure. I really think that no, what they Reigns, should have Reigns winning the Intercontinental title feels right. I really Reigns, think that what Reigns they should have been leading to for the U.S. title. We should have been getting to a big Ziggler Rollins match. That's what really felt like the feud was about from Survivor Series to here is that we were leading to a big fuck off Ziggler versus Rollins thing to like level them both up. Or they I just leave Ziggler for dead. Mapping out in my head how to get Dolph Ziggler to WrestleMania. 
after after Survivor Series, TLC was in Cleveland, his hometown. Would have made all the sense in the world for him to beat. I don't know what he beats. It's beat Seth Rollins in a ladder match for the Intercontinental title. I don't know how Seth Rollins get, gets the Intercontinental title, but get it on him. He wins the main event. He celebrates. Cleveland Rocks starts to play over the PA as he celebrates <laughs> with the fan. Like, give him everything. Have him enter the Royal Rumble number one. Have him win. And then have him beat Daniel Bryan in a 60-minute Iron Man match here at Fastlane to keep his title shot. And, like, you can ha- – like, obviously he's not going to beat Brock. And that's fine. Like, it's not the end of the world for somebody like that not to be able to beat yeah. Brock Lesnar. But at least you've leveled up somebody. Yeah, it would have been huge for him just to be in that match. And I honestly think a Rollins like Ziggler feud with both of them like actually getting pushed could have been hot. If you're if you're attached to putting the belt on Rollins coming out of here, I think Ziggler is a natural like like feud for him coming out of WrestleMania. But instead, Ziggler's in the garbage can. They literally stomp him out of the main event scene in this show. It's a joke what he's doing on this show. We'll get to that. So, as I should say, the main event here is Reigns versus Brian, and if Brian beats Reigns, he replaces him in the main event of WrestleMania. Not he gets added to the match, which would have been a more credible threat, I'd say. Now, the fascinating thing about this is it's such a clear sign that they understand what their fans want. They're oh, not yeah. going to give it to them, but they understand clearly, like... Maybe even stupider, but they think they can steer through the skid and have Brian be a chicken shit and endorse Reigns afterwards, which this only, is the pheno- only made people angrier. The phenomenal idea that Vince McMahon was like, oh, we'll have him shake Roman's hand, yeah. and then the hardcore fans will respect Roman. Oh, what is won't. the matter with you? God, why are they, like, when did Vince McMahon, there was a time where that man got it, I feel like. And I can't pinpoint where he lost it, but man, there came a point where you see Triple H conduct the audience like a maestro now, and it just makes Vince look like such a horrible booker in comparison. That we suffered through 20 years of Vince not being able to get the fans to do what he wanted, to like who he wanted, and we see Triple H just make it look easy now. I honestly don't think that Vince McMahon had control of his audience past WrestleMania 20. Like, I don't, That's I can't, rem- I can't remember any time after that thinking that he really got it. No. Yeah, because Cena and Batista both kind of happened by accident, and then they both fell off so fast. Yeah, the more he that, put his hands that, on the thing. After that, they couldn't get anybody over to save their life. Yeah, Punk happened by accident. Brian happened by accident. Is not only by accident, but actively against what Vince was trying to do. Yes. Oh, they're going to hate this guy for being such a dickhead. Yeah. All right. Can I pitch you my evil idea for how I would have booked this match? Do it, do it, do it. Okay. I would have told the guys, it's a 30-minute time limit. I want you guys to work your match, go until near the time limit. I don't know who's going to win yet. We're going to call it in the ring based on, based on how the crowd's responding to it. Maybe we'll do a draw. Maybe we'll have Roman win. Maybe we'll have Brian win. Just depends on what I'm feeling in the moment. Evil, then, but I think it would have gotten the best performance out of them. Yeah, and then just watch him be like, like tear the fucking house down trying to get the, gra- the brass ring. That's interesting. That's some shit Inoki would have done. <laughs> what if pro wrestling just worked that way? I mean, I think it would be a lot less collaborative, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I love what we would get. Out, I think we would get really interesting dive. That's part of what I would have loved out of it, is they would have been trying to outdo each other and kind of like savage with each other. You know, it's so funny because you've been posting all of the WrestleManias like to our feed, and I just listened to WrestleMania 11, and you're describing Shawn Michaels versus Diesel. Yeah. <laughs> Where Sean was just hoping that Vince was going to be like, ah, oh, fuck it, just put the belt on Sean, he's way better. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. But yeah, I, not, so here's the other thing. What if, fan, what if the promoters gave fans the impression that that's how it worked? Interesting. Because imagine what the atmospheres would be like 
if fans actually thought they could influence the outcome of the match by cheering or booing more. That's a really good point. Like, I'm not sure how you would even do that. And you would have to so strictly keep to, like, if your concrete plan was Roman, but the fans took a hearty dump on him and he sucked, you'd actually have to commit to being like, I guess we got to do Brian. We yeah. got to keep, we got to keep that fucking kayfabe alive. I think you could pull it. So it would have to be something like you'd have to have a really high profile match with a surprising outcome. And then you'd have to put it out to the media that like, oh yeah, they changed it because of the fan reaction. And then like, you know, AEW could pull this off because Tony Khan could then just do some interviews being like, yeah, you know, sometimes I change my mind in the middle of the match based on what the fans are doing. Yeah. It's not that against Roman, he had a great match, but I just, I saw how the fans were responding to Brian out there and I just had to make the call. Like, I think it's the right call. That's what the fans want. I think people would have such fucking erections on Twitter the next day if that happens. We did this. We built this. Of course, there would be, like, spontaneous, gigantic, tribalistic arguments that span for weeks and weeks. But that's just what the wrestling community is now. All right. Before we get to the show, are you ready for this lightning round? Oh, Christ. 2015 lightning round. What is this even going to (laughs) be? There was some weird stuff going on. When asked about WWE potentially running a show during the snowstorm, Connecticut Governor Dan Malloy responded that he didn't follow comedy closely. Didn't follow comedy. Savage. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is after Linda, like, Linda McMahon is at this point a prominent Connecticut Republican who's run statewide twice. So that is clearly a shot at the McMahon family. That is extremely funny. <laughs> WWE Network surpassed 1 million subscribers for the first time. Turns out that free month really worked. I mean, the, they, the idea that they gave up all of the month of February for free so that you would, like, re-up the subscription to keep it for March and get WrestleMania is a really good idea. Seems obvious. Yeah. Justin Gabriel quit the company. He had been the bunny in Adam Rose's entourage. I remember at the time people being like, oh, man, that guy's got so much potential. He's going to go to, like, TNA or something and be really cool. Oh. This man has done nothing. Okay, I had another really fun idea. When Seth Rollins was the champion, I was like, they should let him pick his opponent, and he should pick the bunny, and then it should turn out the bunny is Dean Ambrose. Well... That's both a good idea, but also some shit that Vince McMahon would definitely book because he thought that Dean Ambrose was a comedy character. Yeah, and then he beats him, and you can strip him of the title because he's not supposed to be the bunny. It would be like the Midnight Rider. You you love your Midnight Riders. (laughs) (laughs) Reigns suffered his first singles loss on the main roster when he was pinned by the Big Show. The fact that he had not suffered a major pinfall loss at this point, and that was not really highly publicized at the time, I don't believe. No. But also that it was the fucking big show. And this is the reverse psychology of the time where they're like, maybe the fans won't hate him so much if he loses. But all that did was kill his credibility as someone who could beat Lesnar. It was reported that the plan for WrestleMania was Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus every year. Oh, every yes. year. I, I do remember that now because that was the other thing is it wasn't just that we wanted Bryan in the main event. It was just that we knew if he wasn't in the main event, Vince would cast him into an Irish abyss for all time. Triple H was interviewed on the Steve Austin podcast on WWE Network. How was that? I don't remember his at all. The really notable thing here was he was asked about China in the Hall of Fame, and he gave a very bad response. That's right. I remember. Yeah. That's when we realized that, like, Steve really was going to ask whatever fucking questions he wanted to. Yeah, they never – I don't think they ever did another one of these again after this. Yeah. Like, they did the one with Vince where Vince was surprisingly candid about stuff. Yeah. That because was a if great you, interview. If you could actually sit Vince down, you could actually get shit out of him that yeah. he definitely should not say. No, the guy didn't have much filter. 
But that's why he only did like 10 interviews his entire life. And they were all disasters. Alex Rodriguez and Tori Wilson broke up. Alex Rodriguez had a run of women during this time period that should be canonized in some sort of Hall of Fame. Matched only by CM Punk. Seemingly, yes. <laughs> Mick Foley was caught cheating in a wing-eating contest by putting <laughs> wings in his fanny pack. Jesus, Mick. He was putting wings in his fanny pack? Down bad, yeah. Mick. Mick, come on. We should probably also mention, since you brought up Mick Foley, that he was one of the people really leading the charge in yeah. terms of, like, fuck Roman Reigns, this sucks. Smashed his TV. Yeah, there was a whole cancel WWE Network yep. campaign that he was part of, and it had, like, it hundreds of thousands. It trended number one worldwide on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And to have, like, one of their former stars literally smash his TV with a hammer on Twitter. Who boy. <laughs> And he did this while his son was working for WWE Creative. Yeah. That was probably very awkward for Dewey. Or not his son. No. Wait, I'm thinking it's, it was um, Noel's boyfriend. Yeah, Frankie Frank the Clown. The Clown yeah. yeah. Kevin Owens defeated Sami Zayn to win the NXT Championship. We got to do these NXT shows sometime. I want to talk about this. We've been kicking around the idea of an NXT season for so yeah, long. And the hardest part so about it up. is... Like, where do you start and where do you finish? Yeah. We know we're not going to cover, like, the Johnny Gargano era. You uh-huh. could just put that shit out of your head right now. WB doctor Christopher Amon filed a lawsuit against CM Punk and Colt Cabana for slander based on the comments Punk made on Cabana's podcast. And CM Punk paid that no good motherfuckers legal bills, and now they're not friends anymore. Okay. This is such a – that podcast, yes. is, as you said, one of the weirdest spiral points in the history of professional wrestling. Like, because it's why still dealing with this. The lawsuit that comes out of that is literally what causes the rift between CM Punk and Colt Cabana. Without that rift, Brawl Out never happens. Do you understand that, like, the comments that Hangman made that started the whole thing were in regards to Colt yes. Cabana? <laughs> because they thought that Punk had forced them to get rid of Colt Cabana when he came in, which, which I he think did. That, I think Tony, maybe he did, but maybe Tony Khan was just like, oh, that would be really awkward. We should probably not have Colt Cabana around. Also, why were they employing Colt Cabana in the year 2021? He was booking dark. He was like yeah. Tony's assistant That's booker. A good point. I guess he, he was like, important. He was in, like, a position of power in the company, and, like, he was then immediately sent to Ring of Honor Purgatory and never used again. Josh Matthews started a men's fashion podcast. (laughs) Would you take fashion pointers from Josh Matthews? I've never met a person I would less likely take fashion. but, But, like, you know what? Fine. Like, whatever. He certainly was not. I believe during this time is when he was still the head announcer of TNA. But this is the time where he was also doing, like, their internet stuff and their social media stuff and had no one <laughs> watching like over person, him. He's, like, the only person who worked there at this point. He was literally just, like, feuding with random people on Twitter all the time under the official TNA hashtag. Rock talked about his desire to play Black Adam in a movie someday. Please, In no, a man. monkey's paw curled oh. down. <laughs> And you want to talk about how we ended up where we are. If Black Adam isn't a horrific failure, I don't think Dwayne is back. Dwayne found a monkey's paw in the trash and he said, oh, um, I'd like to own a professional football league. I'd like to star as Black Adam. And I'd like to main event WrestleMania one more time. Yeah. And the monkey's paw curl. Swerve Strickland debuted in Lucha Underground. Kill shot. I love that me and John Moxley had the exact same reaction to finding out that Swerve Strickland was kill shot. And me and most of the rest of humanity were like, what's kill shot? What is kill shot? Literally, there is nothing Steve wants more in the world than to deliver you guys a Lucha Underground season. There is nothing he's ever cared about more. Bring back Lucha Underground. You but know, I don't think it even exists. Tony Khan loved that. He hired every single person who worked there. You're right. 
Jerry Lawler, Ric Flair, Lance Russell, and Dave Brown appeared at halftime of a Memphis Grizzlies game. That's pretty neat. Yeah. The Grizzlies have actually done a ton of wrestling stuff. I think Paige just suplexed their mascot this season. Whoop that track. Yeah. Gave us to the Trick Williams gimmick. Hell yeah. AJ Styles defeated Hiroshi Tanahashi to win the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. Oh, Steve, those were the days. They were. Oh, my God. And finally, the hammer. Vince Russo was reported to be in negotiations with Lucha Underground. <laughs> I, I thought if you wanted Lucha Libras, you were supposed to go to Japan. Oh, my God. Because they Dario Cueto was literally sitting in home, boys. Yeah, out. they were literally sitting in the back like, this is a good soap opera, but we need to get way weirder. <laughs> We need Russo. I, what what could you even do? People were killing each other. Like there was a cannibalistic monster who was the world champion. Like what do you do? What could he? What could he have possibly added? Make Conan was racist? looking around and he was like, "This isn't nearly horny enough." Yeah, that's what he could have done. <laughs> I mean, it was it was still kind of horny. It was sexy, still a little horny. He had sexy star. Uh, he had son of havoc being her bitch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, they had other women, but uh, Eva Lee. I'm trying to think of who their other women were. Uh, I, I don't even know why I'm trying to think of it. I never watched yeah. this shit. Well, the sexy star was the champion at one point. Yeah, she was the world champion. That was a big deal. Very it turned out she was a horrific person. Yeah, she broke somebody's arm. Like, in a, like just shot on her and snapped her arm. It was horrible. We have had two women's world champions ever in the history of wrestling. And they're two of the <laughs> worst people. people. Amazing. <laughs> All right, to get into the show, it's Sunday, February 22nd, 2015. We're at the FedEx Forum in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, you know, sold out 13,000. The show did 46,000 buys, even though it was, you know, for free on w- on WWE Network. That's a surprisingly high buy number. I mean, it's funny because the previous year they had done like 180,000. Yeah, well, not that many more. Yeah. So, like, it, it is funny that, like, there's a obviously a subsection of their audience who is just stubbornly like, I will not get that fucking app. I will yeah. not do it. <laughs> I mean, for a lot of people, just the idea of streaming at this point was not something a section of their fan base was familiar with, or they didn't have a device they felt like they could watch it on. I do often wonder, like, their audience skews so old for their actual television product. I wonder how many of their paying, like, customers just didn't follow them to streaming at all. I mean, they barely ever got above a million subscribers, and I don't know, five million people a week were watching Raw at this time. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. Conversion rate wasn't super. I I just wonder if there's, like, 150,000 people who just stopped giving them money. (laughs) And if so, that was a miserable failure. I mean, in the end, WWE Network was a failure. It wasn't. It didn't put them out of business or anything, but it was an it was an albatross, and the Peacock deal was very good for them. The Peacock deal was good for them just to free them of like yeah. the the money constraints was, of having to run the, that. It was such a money pit. Is I think what they didn't realize was how much it was going to cost to build and maintain it. So like the Peacock deal was a good deal. It wasn't a great deal. The deal they just signed for this shit is an unbelievable deal. <laughs> Uh, no dark match. The opening promo, was this supposed to be a driving simulator? Like, what was yes. the robotic voice? Yeah, that's what that uh, yeah. was. Wasn't in, love, wasn't in love with this. It's extremely bad. First of all, fast lane is a concept. Like, I get it. We're on the road to WrestleMania, yeah. and this is the fast lane. I get it. But, like, there's no theme here. Can we have the, what would it take to get the march to WrestleMania back? I I agree. Or they should just call this Saturday night's main event. What if I just want was? them to call this pay per view the uh, God. What is it like? Biscuits, biceps, and bagels. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biscuits, biceps, and bagels brunch. Yeah, just have the pay per view at noon. <laughs> uh, opening match. We've got the authority of Big Show Kane and Seth Rollins 
against Dolph Ziggler, Ryback, and Eric Rowan. Okay, Steve. So the, this feud has been going on since Survivor Series. Yeah. It is now. <laughs> These guys were on the team at Survivor Series that beat the Authority. It is now four months later. Yep. Why are they still feuding? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. These guys got fired, and then Cena had to win their jobs back with the help yeah. of Sting. That was the wildest thing. Isn't that what he brought the authority back for so he could get them back or something? Oh, no, no. He brought the authority back to, to save that. Edge. Yeah, Seth Rollins was going to curb stomp Edge and paralyze him. Because Sting's back in the wrestling world again, now suddenly baby faces have to make dumbass gullible yeah. decisions. <laughs> Uh, nice pop for Ziggler. No reaction for Rowan or Ryback. Ryback's dead by this point. He has spent a year just getting jobbed out to everyone. I'm trying to remember. Has he already been turned heel and now turned back? Babe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was a heel years before this feuding with Cena. That was 2013. Yeah. Jesus. Like, we are already far past. Literally, that Survivor Series run is such a special moment. Because if you really look at it, the people involved suck so bad, and no one cares about them before or since. But for that one month, they really hit gold with, like, a bunch of no-name dickheads. Uh, It was surprising that Rowan was the one who took the heat here and not Dolph Ziggler. Seems like he was born for that role. But I I can get why, because the fans spend the entire match chanting, we want Ziggler. (laughs) Do you remember or understand what Eric Rowan's character was at this point? Yes. So, he was supposed to be a man with the mind of a child. That's why he has that, like, kind of, like, childlike... But he's a genius, music. they revealed. That comes later, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a genius and, like, a wine connoisseur. Why is his... Like, I don't know how to describe his music... But it's, it's very weird. It's like grass. It, it makes me think of a grasshopper for some reason. Yeah, it's like half, like, like down home, like, gritty, like, southern, like, Bray Wyatt style music. And then half, like, the kind of music that would come out of a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> um, eventually, Rowan hits a super kick and tags in Ryback. Ryback goes to shell shock Rollins, but he gets distracted by Jamie Noble and Joey Mercury. Rollins hits him with a super kick. Um, Rollins jumps off the turnbuckle. Ryback catches him out of the air and hits him with the shell shock, but Big Show breaks the pin up. We get simultaneous tags to Ziggler and Kane. Ziggler super kicks Kane, goes to 10 punch him. But Big Show hits Ziggler with the knockout punch and Kane pins Ziggler. You would think this would be leading to Dolph Ziggler eventually getting one over on the authority, but you would be wrong. Two things about this. One, the the finish to this match is actually kind of neat because, like, Kane holds Ziggler kind of over the ropes and Big Show does, like, a running, jumping knockout punch, which I've never seen him do before. And two... I can fix this match with one simple change. All you have to do is have Dolph Ziggler roll up Seth Rollins and beat him. Yeah. And then beat and then the shit out of him. Yeah. yeah. And then the thing that happens next happens where Randy Orton comes back, making yeah. his return after he's been gone for like six months. And, and, suddenly, saves them. and suddenly you have Ziggler and Orton fighting the authority, and that kicks ass. That's great. Do it. <laughs> yeah. This match wasn't very good. Like, and I don't even want to see this match, but, like, if you do, like, Ziggler Big Show at WrestleMania, at least that's a big win for Ziggler. Like, at least that's something. Did that man ever win a match in his entire career? I don't. He won one, and it was the biggest reaction I've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah, and it was a Money in the Bank cash in. Oh, are are you talking about when he won the Survivor Series match? Both of those, too. Yeah. Two biggest pops we've ever seen. Yeah, two of the biggest moments in the history of <laughs> WWE. Tommy beat the Miz. Yes. Hmm. Every time they gave him the chance, he fucking nailed it. They just only what? did it three times. What was it about Dolph Ziggler that Vince just didn't buy? He's really good looking. He's got a great physique. He's an amazing athlete. 
really good wrestler. His promos weren't amazing, but they weren't that bad. They were fine. There's realistically nothing you can say about Ziggler that you couldn't also say about Shawn Michaels in 1995. And I'm just being honest about that. I'm like just he wasn't gonna the... speculate that he got like everybody like everybody laughed at him when they found out he was dating Amy Schumer. Maybe I don't know. I just you can definitely get heat in this company for dating the wrong person. I also think that Vince probably didn't like who he was friends with. He was always real close with, like, Zack Ryder and that yeah. crew. He was always very online. That's not something that Vince loves. I don't know. All right. Next up, they roll the package for Goldust versus Stardust. The feud we've all been waiting for. People had been talking about this match since Cody debuted on the main roster, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, they weren't talking about this match because no. none of us wanted Stardust or could have no. possibly thought it was coming. They had teased it in the Rumble at least twice. And the it first time they teased reactions. It, it, the first time they teased us in the Rumble, it got like the same reaction that Hogan and Warrior going back to back guy. So we finally get it here. Uh Cody and Goldust started teaming up back in the fall of 2013 to fight the Authority. They had that amazing match where they beat the Shield, one of my like all-time favorite tag matches. They had a you know solid run with the tag belts, and then they lost them, and we assumed Cody was going to turn on Goldust, but it didn't happen. They had a losing streak, and we assumed Cody was going to turn on Goldust, but it didn't happen. Instead, Cody became Stardust, uh, you know, we, even weirder, like, cosmic version of Gold Dust. Okay, and, so, yeah, this is such an example of Cody Rhodes trying to make, like, dog food out of dog shit. Like, they tell him, we're going to make you Stardust. And maybe they didn't tell him, like, the full idea for it, but they're just like, we want you to become a, 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 rest, a dressed up guy, just like your brother, and we'll make you like gold dust and stardust. And Cody's like, <sighs> but he tries so oh, hard. He throws himself into it. He becomes a comic book villain. Channels, I don't know, Frank Gorshin's Riddler or whoever, I can't remember who played the joke, Cesar Romero's Joker from the 60s Batman. Yeah, I just want to be clear, like, this is the most anyone's ever dedicated themselves to something that they knew with their full heart was going to be a disaster. Yeah. Like, no boo-boo face. He goes all into it. And we assume, I assumed this was going to last for, like, two weeks before he turned on Gold Dust. It lasted six months. Like, the idea here is that, like, Cody is now losing. He's lost his identity. He doesn't know who he is. So he throws himself into this character like his brother, but he goes too deep. And he, like, becomes something twisted and different. And Goldust himself remembers when he, too, was something twisted and different and how it ruined his life. So he's going to try to pull Cody out of that. But Cody's going to say, fuck you, old man. And it's going to bring out all the inner bitterness that they've had since, the, like, Cody was a child. And That's it, really intriguing. Remember when these guys wrestled in AEW and it was one of the greatest, most emotional wrestling matches of all time? They did that with no promo. <laughs> no. <laughs> no <laughs> no big nets. At all, and grown men were crying. Like, the moment at the end of that match where Cody says, I don't need a partner, I just need my brother, I fucking cried. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I was, again, it was one of those beautiful moments ever in pro wrestling to see, like, the brothers reconcile. And here, Dusty's still alive. There's so much more potential for this when Dusty's still around. Although, he's, unfortunately, he was really not doing well. He's dead a few months after this. They couldn't, even, almost... they couldn't even bring him out in front of the crowd. They could only do stuff behind, you know, behind the scenes where they could only do stuff backstage where they could pre-tape it. What, I don't remember exactly what he said, but in one of the promos leading into this, Cody said something like, you're going to die, old man. And I was like, oh, nice. fuck. Oh, no. So we see Dusty and Goldust talking backstage. Dusty asks Goldust not to hurt Cody tonight. Goldust won't promise that. He says he's going to beat Stardust out of Cody. That is manifestly not what takes place. No, oh, this like, match is just lifeless. Of, what kind of match would you assume that this was going to be? Like, um, between these two? 
I mean, inc- badass. And now I think they're kind of trying to work a thing where Goldust doesn't want to hurt Cody, I guess. But it doesn't come across. No, it just comes across like it's a boring prelim match. I mean, if these guys went all out, you can imagine what they would do. I mean, again, we saw an amazing match between them and AEW. Also, Cody just doesn't really have an in-ring personality as Stardust. No. I just don't think he really knows what to do. No, because he did really, like, he did change his style. But, yeah, I don't think he had quite figured out, like, how to work the character in the ring at this point. So, like, this match is just kind of nothing. But it also must be said, aside from two notable points during the course of this show, this is one of the deadest crowds I've ever yes. heard in the history of professional wrestling. It are is Memphis silent. Cr- are Memphis crowds usually like this for WWE? I'm trying to remember. I can't remember. I don't, the they're not, like, notorious. The, the other pay-per-view off the top of my head I can think of that was in Memphis was St. Valentine's Day Massacre. I feel like that was a pretty dead crowd, too. But that was also a... Horrible, horrible show. Yeah. This crowd is so dead that there's some guy who's standing vaguely near to the microphones, and you can pick up every time he yells something, (laughs) and this dude delivers some legendary lines that we'll cover as we go through the show. So, Goldust gets Cody in a cradle. The referee pulls his count, but Cody doesn't kick out, but then the referee calls for the bell. Like what? It, what do you think was supposed to happen here? I think that was just supposed to be. You know what? I'm going to say that was supposed to be a near fall, but Vince just said, just send him home. Just, well, they're supposed to call the matches like a shoot, and Cody didn't kick out. That's true. But the other thing is, too, is just like, I, <laughs> this match is so lifeless and it shit. The, and it, it killed the program. I think they were, they were lobbying for a WrestleMania match, which, of course, they would, and Vince was just. And Vince is right to say no. This was awful. Yeah. This now, is, there's a whole way I feel like you could do this where Cody turns back into Cody and then Gold Dust turns into Dustin, but then he goes back to being Gold. There's a whole evolution you could do here, but who cares? Realistically, the only way this storyline works is when Cody turns on Gold Dust. Oh, yeah. He should have, like, taken, like, some makeup wipes out of his pocket, Perfectly. like, scraped off the makeup yeah. and said, I'm Cody fucking Rhodes, the American Nightmare. I won't ever be like you. I'm better than you. All that bitterness, all the real shit, and their jealousy and real feelings towards each other can come out. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to like you just because our old man's dying anymore. I don't yeah. have it in me. Just because we have the same dad and you're the weird dude who is 20 years older than me who would show up drunk to Christmas. I'm sorry you spent all your prime years doing drugs and not succeeding, but it's my time now and stop dragging me down. You're an anchor that dad has saddled me with. Yeah. That that could have been should that feud existed in all of our brains. And that's why that AEW match worked so well with no build, because we were already there. We had already created it and lived it in our heads. Cody would have gotten, I think that could have gotten him red hot. Those promos, he could have just been vicious in those promos. If he could have just done American Nightmare then, how the future would be different? Probably no AEW. Without a doubt, no AEW. He was the brains behind it, really. Uh, they do a backstage segment where Cody attacks Gold Dust, and he tells Dusty he killed Cody by forcing Gold Dust on him. This is sort of the promo we're talking about. Like yeah, Cody delivers of. a pretty decent three minute encapsulation of that. Yeah, it's just so D- rushed. I think Dusty made him take those acting classes growing up. He taught him yeah. well. It's just so funny to hear him, like, deliver this devastating promo to his father and then go... In his weird, <laughs> yeah, in his weird Stardust <laughs> voice. But it's also weird because, like, Dustin at the end of this match comes over and extends his hand to Cody. Cody shakes his hand, walks away, looks conflicted. And then in the very next segment, he runs in. He's just like, hee, 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 I'm evil again. Yeah, I don't know what they were going it's for. so here. weird. 
there's also the possibility that there was a disagreement between Cody and Dustin, and Dusty may have had one vision for this, and Vince had another. That wouldn't surprise me at all. That wouldn't surprise me at all either. I I believe the words bull rope and match probably came into (laughs) Cody and Dustin's version. (laughs) And then uh, maybe we could both get teammates and we could do war games. (laughs) Fucking Vince sitting in his office listening to Cody, yeah. Dustin, and Dusty all pitch a bull rope <laughs> match in war games. And then, uh, you know, Dustin could get fired and he could come back under a mask. Which one of you have I not fired yet? <laughs> and why? <laughs> oh, next up for the tag titles, the Usos defend against Cesaro and Tyson Kidd, or as Vince, I'm sure, referred to them, the goddamn millennials. This Tyson Kidd and Cesaro run is such like a... It lasted like three months, but these guys were awesome together. This was during the era of, what was it, Superstars at the time? Main event, Superstars. Yeah, one of those. Where, like, guys would occasionally just go on a run, ripping off, like, these incredible matches on Superstars, and so they would actually get pushed on the main roster. Because, assembly, someone would make Vince watch Superstars and be like, look, goddammit, push them. And Kid and Cesaro were one of those. The fact that they actually win the titles here is, A, pretty great for them considering they were functional garbage in this promotion, and, B, a real statement about where this division is. It's a rare example of a time where two guys got paired together as a tag team because they had nothing to do, and it turned out awesome. Like, this is a a good team. If these guys, I mean, unfortunately, Kid breaks his neck a few months after this and his career ends. If not, man, these guys would have had some wars with the New Day, with the Usos, with the Wyatt family. There was some good stuff ahead. Yeah, they really miss out on the tag team renaissance that we get basically the following year. And the Usos here are not the Usos yet. They are still very much not there. This feud started with a fight in a restaurant on an episode of Raw. So the idea is, is that Naomi has married Jimmy, and, like, so she's matching the Usos now. So, like, this is sort of a Total Divas extension thing. They were experimenting with trying to get their massive Total Divas audience to actually watch their wrestling product, because they weren't. That integration made sense. There was actually more people watching Total Divas at one point than Raw, and so they were desperately trying to get those women to come and watch the actual product by, like, integrating feuds. It never really worked, but this was one of those attempts. Uh, Good match here. I loved when Jay hit Kid with a Samoan drop into the security wall. Um, Kid got his knees up on a splash and rolled into a small package. Use the sharpshooter, Jay broke it up, and Kid hit a fisherman's neckbreaker for the win. I feel like these guys had a much better match than this on Raw, like a few weeks after this, but this was still pretty good. That's believable. If Tyson Kid had been six feet tall, he could have reinvented the wrestling industry, really. Yeah. He was just doomed to be 5'4". <laughs> Next up, we get a confrontation between Sting and Triple A. How do you feel about a confrontation segment on pay-per-view? Honestly, I don't feel that bad about it, considering that that feud is really the only thing anyone is excited about coming into WrestleMania. <laughs> Pay no homage to when they did this at World War III 1997 with Sting and Hogan. As Steve relates to you the events of what's about to happen... I just want you to imagine an alternate scenario where they do exactly what Triple H and The Undertaker did, where they just walk out, look at each other, look at the sign, and leave. Yep, that probably would have been a lot better. Yeah. Triple H comes out looking very dad core with his leather jacket and his jeans and his taped fists. No one has ever loved denim more than him. (sighs) He doesn't wear the denim vest anymore, though. That is a shame. I wonder if, like, Stephanie burned it. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I thought it to the dog. Sorry. Sting comes out in his theater usher jacket. This is actually a sick jacket. If I could get this right now, I would wear it. 
Triple H talks about Sting being the franchise of WCW, and he says Sting blames Triple H for WCW going out of business. I wish Sting had been like, you had jack shit to do with WCW going out of business. All I wanted to <laughs> be like, oh, wait, are you Steve Austin? No, shut the fuck up. I just really wanted Sting to grab a mic and be like, Terror Rising, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what AEW Sting would have done. Yeah. Jean-Pierre Lafitte or whatever the fuck you were. Oh, ah, wow. Couldn't recognize you at first. Oh, man. Did you hear the story Triple H told about him meeting Nick Khan and Nick Khan being like, oh, I loved you as terrorizing in WCW? No, that's funny as fuck, though. What an alpha. It's also what Tony Khan would say. It's also very – I would bet you $100 million that The Rock told him to say that. Yes. I guess – there's no way Nick Khan watched early 90s WCW. No. Just like The Rock and him were like having a phone call before. You want to talk with them? You want to know what would be so fucking funny? <laughs> uh, Triple H says if Sting walks away, he can preserve his legacy, but if he sticks around, Triple H will destroy him. This they- kicks ass because. He literally just like, you'll get action figures and merchandising and we'll put you in the Hall of Fame. And a guy in the crowd, it's so quiet that a guy yells, he's got a good point, Sting. (laughs) Take the money, Sting. We know you're a businessman. Real estate, Steve. (laughs) Real estate, Steve. Apparently he's killed it in the Southern California real estate market. Well, yeah, that's the other reason why he's actually able to retire is because, like, he doesn't need the money, like, for But he time. doesn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> this is the insane thing. Sting seems ancient here. He somehow seemed younger in AEW. Oh, he looks 10 years younger now than he did here 10 years ago. He looks old as shit here. <laughs> And the presentation is so different. Like, in AEW, he was the ultimate legend, and here he's just another old guy. Well, two things about that that help. Number one, he's, like, a foot taller than everyone in yeah. AEW, so he looks like a monster. Yeah. But also, number two, they they also protect him. Like, he's not just constantly standing in the middle of the ring like a dopey piece of shit. Like, they're doing backstage segments with Darby and warehouses and cool shit like Sting would do. Here, they just keep making him stand out in front of the crowd in harsh lighting, making him look like an old, dumpy piece of crap. So, he does look a million years old. He's got, like, his hair is too long, and he's got it so perfectly cropped. The wrong line. Yeah. He looks like, uh, like a the preacher counter. at a southern church. Youth, youth pastor is a good one. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Also, he says not one word here. No, he didn't talk in front of the – they didn't – did they have him talk the entire time? I'm trying to remember. Which, to be fair, he was most over in his entire career when he didn't talk. Yes, but he also didn't just stand there in the yeah. ring while other people talked no, at he him. he would drop down from the ceiling and beat the shit out of everyone, which they did some of that. He got a monster pop the first couple times he came out and messed up the authority. That moment at Survivor Series is like a top three moment in Sting's career. The time on Raw where JBL said, that's not Sting, that's a picture of Sting. That's not Sting, that's a picture of Sting. Why would it be a picture of Sting? (laughs) What? You think it's just a picture of Sting backstage? (laughs) Uh, Triple H goes to get the sledgehammer. Sting pulls the bat out from under his jacket. It's a trick jacket that holds the bat. I mean, that first jacket kicks ass. <laughs> hold your baseball bat. You can hold an umbrella in there. That would be, be useful. They do this endless thing where Sting, like, pokes the, the bat at his Triple H's throat. Yeah. And so Triple H, like, throws down the sledgehammer. He's like, no, don't kill me. Don't kill me. And then he points at the sign. And then he does it three more times. Why? <laughs> Segment went on and on. Again, what if Sting had just walked out, pointed at Triple H, pointed at the WrestleMania sign? Like, Triple H should have called out Sting. He should, should have made him wait, like, two minutes while Triple H freaked out. Then the lights go out. Then they come back on. Sting's behind Triple H, hits him with the bat five times, points at WrestleMania, and leaves. <laughs> That's fine. Instead, This is endless. 
Triple A Sting hits him with the Scorpion Death Drop, and we're finally out of here. Very long segment. There's also a part in this where Triple H just like punches Sting like 45 times, yeah. and it's just he's just like laying on the ground. And it's just like, oh, he's so old. <laughs> Remember how in AEW he doesn't sell? That's yeah. why he was so over. I what I wanted to see is for him to take a pedigree and then stand right up and beat his chest. I would have run through a brick wall if he had his done old, that. His old tag partner Warrior taught him that one. Yeah, with the Blade Runner magic. Oh yeah, I heard about you from my old friend Warrior. Hey, didn't he, he said he beat you in thirty six seconds? Yeah. <laughs> There's so many savage burns they could have let Sting drop on Triple H here. So many. I also think it's so funny that they spend this whole time being like, you represent WCW. Like, it's been 15 years, but they are desperate not to say the letters TNA. Now, <laughs> Sting did a promo at some point where he said, I'm not here to represent WCW. Like, I don't uh, understand. I feel like that was Triple H's, like, his idea of this feud, and that's why he kept that's referencing Vince. it. That's that's Vince stuff. Vince, yeah. You know Vince was all about. This has to be a WCW thing, and Triple H has to win. Because Sting's original storyline was that he was here for justice. Yeah. Because he was sitting at home watching the authorities shit on all these younger guys, and he just couldn't handle another wrestling company getting yeah. abused like this. And it would make total sense if he hated Triple H because he hates Triple H's friends, the Click. Yeah. I watched your buddy yeah. tank the company that I worked my life for, and I won't let you do it again. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's it. The direction they want. Yeah. Which is funny, because that is the match, though. Because they bring out the NWO, and the, except I guess the NWO so is on Sting's so on side. Sting's side, yeah. Look, I, I marked out like everybody else, but it was deeply stupid. I still think it would have been fucking amazing if this the NWO and DX had, like, squared off, and then they had all whooped yeah, Sting's ass. Sure, yeah. Sting's like, yeah, I can trust Hulk Hogan, idiot. <laughs> Next up, for the Divas title, we've got Nikki Bella defending against Paige. The Bellas poured Tanner on Paige on one episode of Raw, and then the next week, they stole her gear while she was in the shower, resulting in her having to wrestle in one of the Rosebuds outfits. Truly, we are in a grim, dark yeah. era. These people are both capable of good matches. Paige, obviously, is capable of much more than just a good match. Nick is not good by this point. This match fucking sucks. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Every uh, move they do is off. This one about like, five minutes. Paige bangs the back of her head against the mat and whiplash on, like, three different moves. Mm, crazy that she ended up with neck problems, and so did Nikki. Yeah, this is just rotten. Nikki hits a sunset flip powerbomb from the top rope. Paige kicks out, but then Nikki rolls her up and grabs her trunks and gets the pin. This would lead to Nikki getting back up by bringing in AJ for WrestleMania. Yeah. And then AJ and, and, retired, and so did Nikki. And then post WrestleMania is where they finally debut the NXT girls, right? Yeah, that's, that's, couple, that's the summer. Okay, we're almost there. It's almost okay. They show Vince on the cover of Muscle and Fitness at <laughs> sixty-nine years old. Jesus did you also Christ. burst out laughing when they showed this cover? Yeah. <laughs> And Michael Cole reads, like, Vince written copy about, like, Vince overcoming obstacles in his life. This is, like, one of the most hysterical things. And especially knowing that, like, this is right around the time that the shit was going on, guys. (laughs) So. He is ludicrously jacked for a 70-year-old man here. Like, hilariously so. Like, this is a problem. God, when they show him doing the leg curl, the yeah. definition on his quads is insane. Yeah, this isn't just a man who really likes to be fit. This is a man with some mental illness who was working through something. God. Next up, for the Intercontinental title, we've got Bad News Barrett defending against Dean Ambrose. Is Bad News Barrett more or less over than he was a year ago? 
he's more over – he has everything now, right? Yeah. This is that brief, beautiful moment where he's got the name. He's got the That's music. The bullhammer. He's got the bullhammer. He's got the cool cape. He's in, like, the most incredible shape. Like, he should have beaten Lesnar at WrestleMania. <laughs> Vince didn't get it. But then there's also Ambrose, who – I don't know that anyone's ever had a worse look. I what a jackass he looks like in his dad jeans and his dirty wife beater and his stupid haircut. And he's so skinny, he's no, like no definition in his arms. He's got none of the confidence, John Moxley. Like you could not show somebody now, Dean Ambrose, and be like, "Yeah, that's John Moxley." No one would believe you. Ambrose got this match by zip tying Barrett's hands <laughs> post and signing Barrett's name to a contract. Why would the heel authority figures Triple H and Stephanie let that stand? Probably because they thought it was funny. <laughs> like, not the best time for creative in this company. Dean Ambrose spent so much time trying to explain that his character was supposed to be a chaotic madman who could do anything at any time. And Vince kept hearing that, n- nodding and saying, yeah, he's a mischief maker. Zany. Yeah. The fucking segment where he brings out the hot dog cart. I always <laughs> catch up in mustard in dude's faces in the shield. He was a lunatic who would literally like hurl himself at people and like try to bite them to death. And then he just becomes. <sighs> Barrett controls most of the match. He hits the wasteland. He goes for the bull hammer, but Ambrose ducks it. Ambrose fires up, he beats on Barrett in the corner, and he won't stop, and that leads to a disqualification. God. The fans get, like, a little bit into this one, and towards the end, they're kind of getting hot for it, and then this just lets the air out like popping a balloon, man. Because, like, it's not like he's, like, stomping the shit out of Barrett. This is not... Anything on, out of the ordinary. We see something like this in almost every match, and it's never a disqualification. God, it's just so... And Ambrose doesn't even really respond. He's just like, oh, all right, yeah. and then he leaves. <laughs> the lights go out, and ominous music starts to play. Are you ready for another waste of 15 minutes of your life? Druids come out with torches and a casket. And then it turns out it's actually Bray Wyatt in the casket. Joke's on us. We're all fools. I did not remember which Undertaker feud this was. So I was talking to my (laughs) wife, and I was just like, I don't know who's coming out of this casket, but I bet you it sucks. (laughs) Oh, fuck. And then he does a ridiculously long promo. About nothing. He's just like, the Undertaker lived in between. He became a man. I I Uh, used to be afraid of him. (laughs) Guys, I... This uh, is the worst of Bray Wyatt. Horrible. And they had him do these promos every week until WrestleMania. 15 minutes every week he would come out and just ramble about Bullshit. Because he's got nothing to work with. There's no heat in this. Like, he spends two months trying his best with nothing, only to get his ass pinned in the middle by Old Man Taker. Which was his entire career. Yeah. (laughs) He would talk shit about people, and then they would whoop his ass. He really should have beaten Taker. Oh, God, well, yeah, he should have beat Cena the year before. I mean, like, they shouldn't have made this match. It was yeah. not a, it's, they booked themselves into a corner because Bray shouldn't have taken another WrestleMania loss. And, yeah, they're not going to beat The Undertaker again at WrestleMania unless he's retiring, which he should have because he was washed. Yeah. <sighs> 
I don't know, man. I don't know that there's a good answer here. Couldn't have just given us the Taker Sting match I always wanted. I clocked the amount of time it takes them to open the lid and Bray to just come out at four and a half minutes. (laughs) (laughs) And then he talked for at least another five minutes. It's and then nothing else happens. He just leaves. <laughs> like I know I was a fool for thinking the Undertaker was actually going to show up here because in fact he didn't show up at all until WrestleMania. But you couldn't have had like somebody come out, even like Zack Ryder or some shit. Kane, I don't know. Kane. That actually would have been kind of neat if Kane had come out here and been like, "You don't know who you're fucking with." <laughs> Yeah, what you could have done that where, like, each week a different guy who Undertaker had beaten at WrestleMania could have come out and warned Bray, like, what he was doing. He could have gotten somewhere with that. And then, like, the last week it's Triple H, and he's like, look, I'm I'm busy with my own shit, but you should know. Yeah. <laughs> this will drive you to – this will destroy you. Yeah. Instead, he just came out and did the same promo every single week, and – did, I think th- this was another time where they did the spooky stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just a redo of the Kane feud. I still have this idea in my head, because there's some wrestling things that I think fix, like, worms into our brain and they never leave. But the idea of, like, Bray Wyatt beating The Undertaker and, like, absorbing his lightning powers and shit yeah. is something that I think would have been so fun. Pass the torch. Biker Taker passed the torch to Bray. Yeah. Like, he beats Kane and he gets fire powers. <laughs> That's an idea. Then we get a panel segment with Renee Young, Corey Graves, Booker T, and Byron Saxton. I this like was, these things on the pre-show, panel. but I got no time for them in the middle of the show. This, the, I, hit, I start hitting the skip button as soon as I see this. It's also been... At this point, like 20 minutes since anybody was wrestling or anything was happening. It's been, well, really the entire show since anything good happened. Yeah, at this point. It was was cool when Kid and Cesaro won the tag titles. Yeah, aside from that, like, what else on this show made you happy? Anything? I kind of liked what happened next. Rusev against John Cena for the U.S. title. This was kind of fun. John Cena is on his I'm going to like I'm going to become the greatest wrestler who ever lived run. Um I don't know that he necessarily gets there but fuck me is he going for it. So after Cena lost to Randy Orton at the Royal Rumble that was a different time. After Cena that was the year before this he wrestled Randy Orton. What happened this time? I think he just got thrown out of the Royal Rumble. Yeah, he just got thrown out. Triple H said that Cena was washed up, and to prove it, he booked him against Rusev to get his ass kicked. It is fascinating that, like, the premise of this story is that John Cena is a washed-up, shitty old man. Yeah, and, like, he's really not. He's 37, yeah. and he looks 30, and he's in amazing shape. Here, 10 years later, we saw him butt-ass naked on stage at the Oscars this week, and he yeah, looks as good as ever. Yep, he sure does. If anything, bigger. Shit, he's an incredible. I saw him, and I'm like, oh, he's wrestling at WrestleMania. No question about it. And he got himself in, like, he's all tanned and in, like, yeah. real shape. He, he real. tanned, unlike when he wrestled Theory. Yeah, not only is he wrestling at Mania, but they bought him doing something he actually wants to do. Uh, Cena made very inappropriate remarks about Lana, forcing Rusev to defend her honor because he's a secret feminist. Sure. Uh, seen as the aggressor early on, but Rusev gets control. Rusev keeps cutting off his comebacks. Um, Cena goes for the AA. Rusev blocks it. Rusev goes for a swinging side slam, but Cena reverses it into the crippler cross face. Rusev powers out, and JBL questions whether the old Cena would have been able to keep that hold on and win. That's Tired, interesting. sad old man. And, like, Cena kept trying to tell this, like, last gunslinger story. And, like, it only, to this yeah, it only really works when you're, like, actually towards the end of your career. And he still really doesn't look old because, again, he's in better shape than almost anyone on the roster. 
if he wasn't losing his hair, you genuinely wouldn't know. Yeah. It's especially, I think it's especially because he's had to grow his hair out to be an actor. He does look a little weird now. Yep. Uh, Cena hits an AA, but Rusev kicks out. Cena goes for the diving leg drop, but Rusev slams him out of the air and then applies the accolade, and Cena passes out, and Rusev wins. Good was for not Rusev. expecting that, so yeah. This didn't happen in WrestleMania, though. Yeah, that's the thing, is that, like, this is the exact same push that Kevin Owens got, where he yep. actually shockingly did get to beat Cena the first time, but then, of course, he's going to job his ass out. Rusev proceeds to lose to Cena for the next three pay-per-views to make sure we get the point that he's inferior. Oh, yeah. Does get us the Cena U.S. title. Open challenge out of it, though. That was cool. That is probably the coolest run of his entire career. They do another panel segment, and then it's main event time. Daniel Bryan versus Roman Reigns, the main event of WrestleMania on the line. Now, how did you feel about this match coming into it? Like, what did you think you were going to get here? I thought it would be a good match and that Reigns would win. You know, I was no. I was hopeful Daniel Bryan had kind of been Lazarus. He had kept coming back from the dead. But I was just like, I don't think they're going to do it again. This is also an important point in history. Because up until this point, Roman Reigns had not had anything even approaching a passable no. singles match. You know, during his one, he had one pay-per-view singles match. Yeah, he had one pay-per-view singles match before this. Yeah, so the book on him was that he couldn't work, just like everyone used to say about Cena during his similar push. So this match was also important, because not only was this supposed to prove that, like, Roman Reigns is good, you guys, like, blah, blah, blah. But if he could actually deliver in this match, maybe people would, maybe the hardcore fans would actually start to like him. That does not take place. But he does deliver. (laughs) <laughs> Has anyone ever not been able to have a good match with Daniel Bryan? Ooh, I'm has, sure if we really has, thought about has it. Has Bryan Danielson ever had a bad match? Interesting. No, literally nothing's jumping out at me. I'm going to think about it, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think there's a few guys. I'm trying to think. Chris Benoit is another one where I'm just like, I don't think that guy ever had a bad match. But, yeah, Danielson struggled to think of a match he ever had that wasn't good. Well, unlike Benoit, too, because Benoit's matches were always good, but they were always similar. And the same with Bret Hart. Danielson's probably the greatest wrestler of all time because he can have any kind of match with anyone. <laughs> And that's one thing that we're really seeing in his AEW run is how much, like, how handcuffed he was in WWE, where you really have to have the same match. You have to do the same spots. Right. And, like, did you ever see that one match he did? They they were doing, like, Saturday Morning Slam, like the kids show, and they did, like, one match that had zero bumps in it between him and Tyson Kidd where they just did all comedy spots for, like, ten minutes. No, that sounds amazing. I know yeah, on that can... show you weren't allowed to do any shots to the head on that show. Yeah, literally it was all comedy spots from start to finish. And it was a genuinely a pretty good match. Like, he's capable of that. And also the crispest catch wrestling. And also the greatest puro. And the death matches. Like, there's nothing he can't do. Just visceral, hateful booze for Roman Reigns when he makes his entrance. And, like, I felt it viscerally. Because at this time, I didn't hate Roman Reigns as much as everyone else did. But, like, at the same time, when he came out here, his look is awful. Like, the vest looks stupid. Why are you, like, the fact that a baby face is wearing a D'Lo Brown chest protector to the ring is absurd. Somebody actually did suggest this to me. I think it was my wife suggested this to me today. And I want to make a point of this because I had never considered it. But he might actually have, like, some chemotherapy scars on his chest during this period. Maybe. I mean, I don't think he doesn't seem to today. Yeah, I, well, it's possible to get, like, plastic surgery to cover that stuff up. Yeah. But I, like, we don't – it could very well be something like that. He could have gotten, like, a pec surgery similar to The Rock. Yeah, I, I think there's something he, I extra there. He was, I also assumed he was kind of chunky. I don't think he's he was. Not today. Really he's in amazing shape now. Yeah. I don't – like, when he was in FCW, too, like, he was never, like, a body guy. 
He's he's yeah. big, but he's not like he wasn't ripped. He is now. Has there ever been a ripped Samoan? I mean, The Rock, but he's only half yeah. Samoan. <laughs> yeah, it's just not, those Samoan genetics are tough. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they spend the first couple minutes feeling each other out. Reigns gets the advantage, and he runs Brian into the ring post. Uh, Reigns cocks his fist, and he goes for the Superman punch. Brian nails him with a roundhouse kick right to the spleen. This was Holy perfect. He, this was so great. I mean, I guess this is the good thing about the suit of armor, is you can just shoot, kick him as hard as you want, and it won't hit him. It won't hurt him. Yep. And that is, like, I mean, he's wearing literally, like, a fucking flak jacket vest. Like, fucking just kick him away, man. <laughs> Brian has kick pads on, so, yeah, you can kick him as hard as you want. It's not going to hurt him. Uh, like, l- let's think about, like, what Brian's mission is coming into this match, because he knows that his job is to get Roman over. And, like, yeah. he's going to try his best. And so his idea is, I'm going to beat the shit yeah. out of Roman and Show make people, people think that he's he tough. Yeah. Uh, he hits a bunch of kicks. He goes for a Frankensteiner off the top, but Reigns counters with a power bomb. Reigns goes to the top, but Brian crotches him and hits a super back <laughs> suplex. Brian then locks in the yes lock, but Reigns crawls his way to the ropes. Um, Reigns rolls to the floor. Brian hits him with two suicide dives. When he goes for a third, Reigns catches him out of the air and hits him with a belly-to-belly suplex. It was very cool. Yeah, it was. Reigns then goes for a spear, but Brian dodges and Reigns hits the steps. You know, if Daniel Bryan's going to win, that would be how. But yeah. maybe, Ro- maybe Roman, like, actually got a concussion and couldn't continue. That's fair. <laughs> he still, they still, they still would have had Roman pin him. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Like, Vince, Brian would have had to, like, deadweight him into the ring and roll him on top of himself. <laughs> Thrown him on top of Brian for the pen. Oh, I think Brian got a hernia lifting reins. Oh, he fell down. He can't get up. Uh, back in the ring, Brian goes to the top rope. He dives off but gets hit with a Superman punch. Reigns sets up for the spear. Brian gets him with the running knee. That was awesome. Yes. Reigns kicks out, and at this point, I'm like, oh, okay, that's it. Match is over. Yeah, there was there was no ch- – because he's damn sure not going to tap out. That's just not going to happen. Brian tries the yes kicks. Reigns blocks. Brian rolls into an arm bar and then transitions to the yes lock. Reigns manages to roll it over, and he pummels Brian. Brian sets up for the running knee, but Reigns catches him with the spear and gets the one, two, three. Great match. I think it's still one of Reigns' better matches. Yeah. Like, this match severely over-delivered, to the point where this pay-per-view, which we might remember as one of the shittiest of all time, really, is, like, completely redeemed by it, and actually was pretty well fondly thought of. This match, and a lot of people really think that the Brock match at WrestleMania is an incredible match. I love that match. I mean, some people hate it. Some people think it's fantastic. But those two matches back-to-back really help Reigns along. He does not get cheered for a very long time. But, like, there starts to be, like, an element of respect. Like, well, actually, he can work. We just don't want him there. Yeah. I mean, I think both guys did their job here. Yeah. Reigns, you know, he sold. He hit a bunch of cool stuff. Obviously, Danielson made him look like a million bucks. I want to be clear that at this point, Reigns is less than three years in the business. It's crazy. Like, people don't talk about this with him, but they launched him onto the main roster so fucking fast. I mean, did he even, like, he was just on NXT TV, NXT TV almost right away, right? Did he even have any time period where he was training there? All of his actual wrestling was in FCW, as I recall. I don't remember him. Maybe he wrestled in an early NXT. I don't know. I know that when The Shield first debuted, they debuted in NXT first. But, like, I think, honestly, they had, like, taken him out of the, like, off the road to, like, get him ready for The Shield. I don't even know who trained him. Did his dad train him? Good question. I don't know. 
Uh, let me look. I'm curious about his Wikipedia page. Um, he was seemingly immediately signed. To yeah, FCW. trained by Offen Sika. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure. That, like, like the Rock, he just worked out a little bit, and then he knew how to wrestle. Because he finished football in like '08, and by and he then debuted he, and then in '10. Then he had cancer. He spent yeah. you know, two years dealing with his cancer. Beat I back, this, got back in shape, and started wrestling. I think this was a case where like Vince knew about him when he was yeah. like 13 and was just waiting for him to get oh, yeah, old. Yeah, he was, enough, go, he was going to shows when he was a kid. Same thing with Randy Orton. Like they just Cody was like that. They just signed him as soon as they got out of high school. In those cases. Yep. Roman had a successful football career and maybe could have made it in the NFL if not for his cancer. Yeah, it's possible. Better it's football so... player, better football player than The Rock. Now that's interesting because like everyone treats The Rock like he was a fantastic football player, and he was on anywhere. those was dominant on Miami. Miami teams. He was Miami sucked by the time he actually played. I love. Here he like he's like yeah I lost my spot to Warren Sapp and then Warren Sapp came out later like nobody was losing oh, their spot to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> just, yeah you never played because that hack Mario Cristobal injured him yep um all right this show oh the main event atrocious. Like, genuinely, Horrible. like, a total crap fest. We don't usually bury shows, and maybe this is just colored by how I felt about wrestling at the time, but I thought this show was bad, bad, bad. Like, you just have to understand that if we weren't covering this because it is the natural end point for this season, as the, the literally the period that is the direct corollary, the direct lead-in to what we're experiencing now, we would not have ever done this show, because the show fucking sucks, and it was not fun to watch. However, I am glad that we covered it, because it was fun to watch that main event again. And again, on Cody Watch, on Finish the Story Watch... What a joke. What an throughout the course of this, Throughout the course of this season, he has been, like, nine years old, and on the pre-show, the pre-show, the pre-show, and wrestling his brother in a god-awful match that sucks. Yeah, and now he's one of the biggest stars in the world. It's just fascinating, guys. So this show, interestingly, segues very nicely into our next show, where we're going to go somewhere we've never been before. The post-pandemic era of wrestling. Ooh! See, now, we told you we would never do the Thunderdome. And we will not... I made a promise to a dying man. We will never cover a show from the Thunderdome. However, we've now been doing this podcast for so long that there have now been (laughs) other manias after the Thunderdome. Yeah, we are, uh, we're doing it. WrestleMania 2021 from Tampa, Florida. A WrestleMania I perhaps anticipated more than any in history. Not because it was all that good or exciting a show, but just because I was incredibly bored at the time and desperate to watch a wrestling show that had fans in attendance. It's a show that I think lots of us have mixed feelings about because of, like, it was a time when it's not nearly as full a WrestleMania as other WrestleManias. It's not nearly as exciting as one. It was such a complicated time in our history. It's going to be hard Not to kind of revisit what that moment meant to both of us. So much of this show is like everything I think about this show is just like my excitement for it because it represented the fact that the world could return to normal. Yeah. It's one of the, it's like, uh, like I watch the Last Dance documentary probably three times a year every year. Is that because it's amazing? Probably. But is it also because I will never forget that it was the only lifeline during that horrific period that we had? You and me were sitting around texting each other watching it at the time. It was appointment viewing. It was the only appointment viewing. There's nothing else on TV. It may have been the last appointment viewing ever in television. Yeah. So, again, this is going to be really fascinating to talk about. It's also going to be the first two-night WrestleMania we've covered. Guys, I don't know if we're just going to do, like, a five-hour podcast. I don't know how this is going to go. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Simultaneously, it feels like there's also going to be a lot of backstory here. Cause there's some weird stuff going on, and we haven't done 
One is, I mean, the most recent thing we've kind we I pieced together a show about the 2020 quarantine WrestleMania just from our live reactions at the time. But other than that, the closest show to this we've covered is WrestleMania from 2019. So basically, like, we're going to kind of have to gift wrap the whole Thunderdome era in the pr- lead up to this WrestleMania. Guys, <laughs> uh, some weird shit was going on. Uh, some incre- Also, weird shit that I watched a lot of it in the beginning when you weren't, and you, I think you've gone back and watched some of it towards the end. Is that right? I've, I've been watching the Raw and, Raws and Smackdowns that led up to this, and they are a dystopian hellscape. Also, there's just something... Something about not having a crowd just it the fundamental lie of pro wrestling become we see how absurd this is when there isn't a crowd to react to it. It's like watching a magic trick, but you have a camera on the guy's hands the whole time. Yeah. Like it's especially at the beginning before the Thunderdome when there was no one there, but they still had to do all their poses and play to the crowd, either because Vince told them to, or they just literally couldn't untrain themselves from it. They were so used to it. And also like before they started pumping in fake crowd noise and oh, they were just God. wrestling in silence and you could hear every spot they were calling. Lots of grunting. Oh, God. And the other thing was just, because it's WWE, they couldn't really, they couldn't bring themselves to acknowledge that any of this was insane and absurd. It had to be presented just dead-ass seriously, and without any acknowledgement that anything was going on. They were just kind of like, this is the most unusual episode of Monday Night Raw in history. In retrospect, it's so obvious that they should have just done, like, some kind of, like, semi-serialized, like, wrestling TV show kind of thing. Like, just turn it into, like, a sitcom or something different. Like, you don't have to pretend like it's the same. It's not going to be the same. Yeah, we're going to have a lot. To, it's interesting. That we're going we're gonna to be – next week's going to be very metaphysical as we talk about kind of what is professional wrestling. What does it really mean? What does it represent? Were those were those pre-recorded, you know, theatrical matches? Were those really pro wrestling? What about the Randy Orton Edge match, where they they clearly, you know, did multiple takes and like paused and cut? Was that actually pro wrestling? Was it something different? These are the big questions we're gonna ponder next week when we cover 2021 WrestleMania. The the subtitle of this WrestleMania is Kevin Dunn Unleashed. Yeah, not for the best. So yeah, oh. we'll have all that more next time on the Lawcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next time.